Hey everyone. So Dr. Jamie, and today I'm here to talk to you about one of my favorite topics because it's just so fascinating and it comes with some really fun images. It might not seem relevant to your life, but if I do my job right by the end of this lecture, you'll understand just how important VD in World War II is to your life. So really quickly, let's back up. VD is a phrase that many of you may not have heard. Um, it means venereal disease, and so it's now what we would call STIs, sexually transmitted infections. But for the purposes of this lecture, we're gonna use the language of the time. And so when I reference VD, you can think STI. So it turns out that VD is, was a huge deal in World War II. And when I say huge deal, um, I don't specifically mean that there was a lot of it, although there was, there's always a lot of STIs or VD in wartime. What I mean is that it was considered and treated like a public health crisis. And so part of what you have to understand there is that historically, VD has both killed a lot of people in war, and it has uh, caused armies to lose a lot of manpower. So I'm gonna give you some facts and figures in a little bit, but first let's get to the images because those are my favorite part. Okay, so granted, this first image is not my favorite part. So, this is someone that you have to know for the purposes of this lecture. This is Dr. Thomas Perrin Jr. He was the Surgeon General of the United States from 1936 to 1948. Um, one of the things that's hard for a modern audience to understand is just how important the Surgeon General was before the beginnings of the CDC. So, of course, with COVID-19, a lot of us, um, we're hearing a lot from the World Health Organization, and if you're in the United States, you were hearing a lot about the CDC or Center for Disease Control. That's where a lot of our public health information comes from. That's where our public health research is centered. That's where we get a lot of our public health guidelines. The CDC is hugely important to public health in the United States, but the CDC has only existed since after World War II. So who or what filled the role of kind of our public health nexus before the CDC? Well, it was the Surgeon General. So whereas now we don't hear a lot from the Surgeon General, um, it, so it's a role that we still have, um, but they are much less of a public figure before the CDC and particularly in World War II, the Surgeon General was a hugely influential office. And Thomas Perrin, in particular, was a hugely influential sur Surgeon General. He made a lot of changes in a lot of areas. And he had a passion for VD. And so um, what I mean by that is he really wanted to destigmatize talking about venereal disease as a moral failing, and he wanted to talk about it as a public health matter. He wanted to talk about it as a scientific problem that could be solved with scientific methods. And so he did a lot of work around that. And we're gonna talk about some of that today. So this is a guy you have to know, we're gonna reference him over and over and over again, the good, the bad, the ugly. So just kind of tuck him away in the back of your mind. Okay, so uh, take this image in for a second. I want you to just kind of sit with this. Um, see what you can notice about this image. What is it that sticks out to you? Oops, let me see if I can make that full screen for you again. Sorry about that. Okay, so this is an image that uh, the director of the Chicago Public Health Services used when he testified before Congress in February of 1938, Valentine's Day of that year, actually. So he was testifying before Congress about how effective his treatment 
of venereal disease and slowing the spread of venereal disease in Chicago had been. And he was specifically arguing that Congress should allot funds to the Venereal Disease Control Act of 1938 so that we could implement a nationwide program like the program in Chicago. And as part of that, he used this graph that you are seeing right now. So in this graph, uh, there is the source of infection, right? And you can see near the bottom here that the source of infection is a 13-year-old girl. Yes, those are their ages up by their heads. And she had sex with three men, a 21-year-old, a 35-year-old, and a 31-year-old. So already we are on very questionable ground. I can tell you that Dr. Bundinson who was the director of the Chicago Public Health Board, who was presenting this Congress, did not comment on the relative ages. Again, we're trying to move away from the idea of morality. As a feminist researcher, I would say moving away from sex being buried in morality is not the same as sex being embedded in ideas of consent. And I don't know how much a 13-year-old can consent to sex at all, let alone with a 35-year-old. Um, but that is a topic for a different lecture. So those three men had sex with other people. So this 31-year-old had sex with a 17-year-old and a 16-year-old. So he's got a type. This 21-year-old had sex with a 14-year-old and a 15-year-old. So he's also got a type. Uh, this enterprising 17-year-old apparently had sex with both the 31-year-old and the 35-year-old. Oops, sorry, that's her line right there. So you can see it goes out, right? It traces, it labels the 13-year-old girl's source, source of infection. She reported that she had sexual contact with three men. The Chicago Board of Public Health then followed up with those three men and asked them to report who they had had sexual contact with. Um, and then they reported their contacts and they did the process again. So they followed up with each one of those people and asked who they had had contacts with and so on and so on until you have a total of, I believe there's 38 pe 35 people in this image. Um, so you can see it's kind of interesting, the figures um, in general, we have our kind of woman-shaped blob and our man-shaped blob and you can tell the difference because the man-shaped blob has pants or rather two separate legs uh, and a hat. Um, one 15-year-old girl apparently had sexual contact with a 70-year-old man, and you can tell that he's older because he has a cane attached to his blob. Another 15-year-old girl had sex with a 12-year-old boy. And what's really interesting about this image to me is that this 12-year-old boy is about three-quarters of the size of the men on either side of him, and uh, he's wearing different clothes, right? So he's wearing short pants, and it kind of looks like he has a little cap. What's interesting about this is if you know the history of fashion, so this image was produced in 1938, um, this style of short pants was at least a decade out of common children's wear. And so they've actually um, gone a little bit back in time just to make sure that the viewer looks at this and knows that this 12 year old is a child, which is not a courtesy they give to the 13 year old source of infection. So the oldest woman in the graph i'm looking for her really quickly the oldest woman is 48 she's back here she is about the same size if not a little smaller than the 13 year old so apparently in the logic of this graph once you as a woman are old enough to have sex you are not afforded the luxury of being considered a child um whereas with a boy you are so that is an interesting thing to note. All right, so a couple of things here. Um, this graph is charting the spread of syphilis in Chicago. And so most of us don't talk about syphilis. Um, if you happen to get syphilis, it is treatable with a course of antibiotics. Um, and so it's no longer the kind of life ruining disease that it was uh, prior to the mass production of syphilis. Mass pro nope, sorry, mass production of penicillin. Mass production of penicillin um, really did not happen until right near the end of World War II. So for most of World War II, 
people were, tr they had antibiotics, they were sulfur-based antibiotics, they took a course of about three weeks to work. And previous to that, there were treatments for syphilis. Um, it was a year's worth of shots, and those treatments were mercury and arsenic-based. So I've had people ask me in the past, are mercury and arsenic really cures for syphilis? And the answer to that question is sort of, well, they kill syphilis faster than they kill you, so yes-ish. Um, so this wasn't a simple disease that could just be treated with a seven or 10 day course of antibiotics like it can be now. Your best case treatment is three weeks long. And sometimes the first course didn't take, so you would have to do a second three week long round course of antibiotics. Um, so, at best, you're taking three weeks. At worst, you're taking a year's worth of treatment. And treatment was hugely important because syphilis is really a life-ruining disease. And again, it's not a disease we talk about a lot nowadays. So syphilis has um, four stages. So in the first stage, you develop a syphilitic canker. Um, which is pretty much exactly like it sounds. If you've ever had a canker sore in your mouth, it kind of looks like that, um, except it typically appears on your genitals. Um, there's no kind of adverse reaction. It, um, it doesn't itch, it doesn't hurt. There's nothing that would really draw your attention to it. And so many, many, many people developed a syphilitic canker a couple of weeks after contracting the disease and they never noticed. So they don't know they have the disease. Um, in stage two, syphilis spreads all through your body. It spreads through your nervous system. Stage three is really dangerous because stage three, it goes latent, right? And so you have no more signs of the disease. You would not know that you had it unless you went through very specific medical tests. Um, and then stage four is the really deadly stage of the disease. A stage four syphilis essentially comes out of your nerves and starts fucking shit up. So um, sometimes people would have to have limbs amputated. Sometimes it would mess with the function of your limbs. A lot of people became disabled because of syphilis. And in its most advanced stage, it essentially eats its way through your brain in something called neurosyphilis. Um, Al Capone had neurosyphilis. Um, some people have theory theorize that Donald Trump has neurosyphilis, um, which is just a note. So syphilis was a life ruining disease and there was a huge impetus to catch it early and to treat it and to stop its spread, um, which is why programs like this were considered really important and actually revolutionary. Um, and so it's devastating from a public health perspective in general. However, it's particularly devastating from a public health perspective in times of war. And the reason for that is because prior to World War II and about halfway through World War II, if you were diagnosed with VD, then a couple of things happened. So if you were not in the army, but you were a man who wanted to enlist in the army, you could not do so if you had VD. If you were in the army but had VD and it was found out that you had VD, then you would be considered um, injured outside of combat. You would have to take time off for your treatment and go to a separate treatment ward um, and be treated again for a minimum of three weeks. And whatever time you were out being treated for your VD would be time you would have to make up at the end of your enlistment. Um, and you also weren't getting paid during that time because from the Army's perspective, you weren't working and you weren't. You were in a hospital bed in a syphilitic ward getting sulfur antibiotics, usually through an IV. So it was not pleasant and had many repercussions, both financial and social. So um, part of why we, Congress was appropriating funds or debating appropriating funds to the veneer the Venereal Disease Control Act of 1938 is because at that point, the US government knew we were going to join World War II at some point. It was a matter of when, not if. 
And so the US government was trying to put us in the best possible position to join the war. And part of what that meant was have as many able-bodied, healthy young men as possible ready to enlist. And so at that time, remember, you couldn't enlist if you had VD. And so there was this huge push to curb the spread of VD in our communities so that when we went into World War II, we would have a larger pool of fighting force to pick from. So that's why Congress was hearing this testimony from Dr. Bundinson of Chicago Public Health. That's why he was showing them this graph about what he had done in Chicago and how it had helped curb the spread of syphilis through his community. So what happened was Congress did appropriate those funds um, in the VD Control Act of 1938. And um, so we instituted programs like this kind of nationwide. Then, as you know, in December of 1940, the United States entered World War II officially. So once we entered World War II, uh, the government decided to ramp up anti-VD campaigns. And so again, they wanted to make sure they had a large pool of healthy, able-bodied young men to pick from, to enlist, and ultimately draft to fight this war. And so part of making sure that they could do that was making sure that they curbed the spread of BD. And so one of the ways that they did this was by creating and issuing a lot of anti-VD propaganda. And that's what we're gonna look at next. So um, these, by the way, every poster I'm gonna show you today and the little excerpt on the side is directly from the National Library of Medicine, National Institute of Health, National Institute of Health visual archives. So I literally just plucked these posters and the descriptions from their website. I have not edited this at all. I have not cherry picked this. Um, you can go to their website. I've included the source for you at the end of this presentation and see all of these things. So this is um, my first one, Juke Joint Sniper. You kind of have to read it punchy like that, you know? Syphilis and gonorrhea. So this is a woman, um, she looks kind of angry. She looks kind of rough. Um, she is outside of what is a dance hall. It kind of looks like a bar. Um, she is smoking, which in the 40s and 30s was very much code for kind of like bad woman or loose woman. So the text on the National Library of Medicine's website next to her is really interesting. I've included the first part of it for you here, and I've bolded the very first sentence, which is, while posters generally made prophylaxis, um, condoms and preventative measures, the soldier's responsibility, women were invariably represented as the cause of the venereal disease problem. So that's interesting, right? Because, excuse me, venereal disease is bacteria, right? It's bacteria that's passed between bodies. It's not gendered or sex. It doesn't, it's not manufactured in women's bodies and given to helpless men, nor is it manufactured in men's bodies and given to helpless women, right? It's bacteria. It exists in the world. Bodies get it regardless of sex or gender. Bodies pass it on <laughs> regardless of sex or gender. Um, so it's interesting, right, that we're having kind of this national archive, even today, saying that the response to VD in World War II was very gendered, that it was often seen as the fault of women. So when I'm teaching this class live, I like to walk people through a little visual rhetoric exercise of kind of breaking down this poster. And some of it, I already said, you know, she looks kind of mean, she's smoking, which is code for bad woman. She's out alone outside of a dance hall. You know, it's all just kind of very things good girls didn't do. But I think the most interesting thing about it is this text right here, juke joint sniper, right? So think about that, what that means. That means that her body is as dangerous to individual men, to our armed forces, and ultimately to national security as an enemy sniper, right? So she is taking out our fighting forces, like a sniper. She's endangering her country like an enemy sniper. It's a really interesting kind of powerful image and tagline. Let's look at another one. 
she may be a bag of trouble, syphilis, and gonorrhea. So this one I love for a lot of reasons. Um, I love her dark hair. I love her beret. Again, she's smoking, which is code for bad woman in the 30s and 40s. Um, so one of the things that I really love about this woman, um, I've showed this to audiences over and over again, and they always say she looks kind of French. And I think it's the beret that does it. I think it's the beret and the dark hair that makes a lot of audiences think there's something French about her, which is a really interesting take because at the end of World War I, France had the state-run brothel. So if you were a sex worker, you would register with the state, you would say, I'm a sex worker, you would work in a state-run brothel, you would get periodic tests for VD, etc. Um, and so at the end of World War I, there's actually kind of a squabble between the U.S. government and the French government. The U.S. government said, hey, your brothels, your state-run brothels are infecting all of our GIs in France with venereal disease. Close them down. They're not good for our army. We're losing days because, again, when you got venereal disease, you were kind of taken out of your position for the course of treatment. We're losing days. We're not doing our job well. Shut down your state-run brothels. And the French government said, are you insane? We are broke. The only part of our government that's making money right now are our brothels because of your soldiers. And so I think it's, it's kind of darkly humorous that so many students interpret this image as French because it kind of, for me, calls back to the squabbles between sex work and the French and U.S. government. Um, so yeah, bag of trouble, syphilis and gonorrhea. Easy to get. Um, so this one kind of has some similarities to Jeep Joint Sniper, right? So it's all covered in red, you know, danger signs. Um, she's again, you can't quite see it here, but she is holding a cigarette, she's smoking. She's looking into the alley not out towards this kind of like little slice of Americana Main Street behind her, right? So she's trouble. Dun, dun, dun. Venereal disease covers the earth. Learn to protect yourself now. Um, so again, we've got the beret and the dark hair. She's very clearly moving um, towards the United States, right? So she's a threat that the proportions are interesting. Right, so her torso is roughly the size of North America and uh, Central America. Um, so she's disproportionately huge, like the threat is disproportionately big, right? Um, okay, let's get to my absolute favorite one. She may look clean, but pickups, good time girls, prostitutes, spread syphilis and gonorrhea. And then my favorite line here, you can't beat the axis if you get VD. Um, so again, what's so interesting about that line, right, is it is explicitly connecting sexuality and national security. So if you have sex with the bad type of woman, you are not only endangering your body, but also our national security. And again, look at kind of the proportions here, right? So sh her head is huge and it's looming over these three men. Um, and so we've got someone in an army outfit, we've got someone, we've got a sailor, and then we have just kind of a guy in a gray suit, right? So like yet to enlist, could be anyone. And she's looming over all of them. Um, and all of these posters were made the same year. They were all made in 1940. But what's really interesting in She May Look Clean But is the tone has changed. So I'm gonna take us back to some of the other posters. Um, so again, these all can very much, if you know sort of the visual codes, the pop culture tropes of the 30s and the 40s, be read as bad women, women right? They're smoking, smoking um, outside on their own, um, smoking outside on a corner. Um, you know, she's got that come hither pose, um, the plunging neckline. She's moving menacingly towards the U.S., but she may look clean as a huge departure from that, right? This is the girl next door. She's not a bad woman. So what makes 
the woman and she may look clean, but bad. Well, that's very, very simple. The thing that makes her bad is that she wants to have sex outside of marriage. And that makes her dangerous because as noted, you can't beat the access if you get VD. All right, so here's my sources for you. Let me, I'm gonna leave those up for just a second. Um, I wanna talk about this one, the archives at the library for the University of Minnesota. So, like I said, I got all of these posters and the accompanying descriptions from the National Library of Medicine, which is part of the National Institute of Health. This is a .gov website. Um, I got these images today. So the 23rd of March, 2020, I pulled them off of their website. Um, but here's what's really interesting. Those are five of the seven posters they have up for World War II. Um, one of the posters on the website that they have showing anti-VD propaganda for World War II doesn't have any people in it. It's just a purely text-based poster, which is really in line with the social hygiene campaigns of the 19th century and the early 20th century, like up through World War I. And then one of the posters just has two soldiers. It has no women in it at all. So what's really interesting and why I have these two archives listed here for you is because you can actually go to this archive at the University of Minnesota and they have a fantastic online archive of posters, propaganda posters for World War II. So what I did in 2012 um, when I was first doing this research is I actually searched their archive for all VD propaganda posters and there were a little over 100 of them. Um, when you got rid of duplicates, about 109. And so I then did a further search of not just how many are there, but how many, like the ones we've seen today, feature women as the center of the image. So let me show you what I mean by that. So here in She May Look Clean Butt, you have both a woman and three men, but you can see that she's the visual center, right, as she is meant to be. And it's even more clear in these other posters. The woman is the visual center of all of these. So I looked not just at how many VD posters were um, does in the archive, anti-VD propaganda posters, but I looked at how many of them had women as the center. And so out of roughly 109 original posters, uh, nine of them, had women as the center of the image. So that means that posters which featured men outnumbered posters which featured women by a ratio of almost 10 to one. And it's really, really interesting that the government archive would kind of flip that ratio and have one poster that features a man and five that feature women as the center of the image. When that is, not historically accurate. Um, and, you know, so you start to ask, why would they do that? Why would they choose those images which are harder to find because there were fewer of them? Uh, they don't represent kind of the tone of the propaganda at the time. Um, and I think to answer that question, we really have to go back and look at what the posters are saying. So I'm going to take us back one more time. Um, and so we're just going to focus on this poster. But this poster and all of the anti-VD posters that feature women have one thing in common, right? And that is the idea that as a man, and this is World War II being produced by the U.S. government, it's very heteropatriarchal, very gender, sex binary, um, very cis focused. So as a man, if a woman wants to have sex with you outside of marriage, there is something wrong with her. And as all of these posters have said, she's probably diseased and she's a threat to national security, like a sniper right? Because you can't beat the axis if you get VD. So if you can't have sex with a woman who wants to have sex with you because she's not safe, then what's left unsaid there is that the only women who are safe to have sex with 
are women who don't want to have sex with you. And of course, as we all know, the word for that is rape. So when feminists talk about this thing called rape culture, rape culture is this idea that in certain cultures like ours, the idea of rape is normalized. It is an expected part of a woman's experience and just kind of a part of culture that we all sort of regret, but don't seriously question. So um, I'll post in the description of this video, just like I did in the last video, a brilliant analogy, you know, if we, treat, if we treated robberies like we treated rapes, right? Like if someone gets mugged and they, their wallet gets stolen, we don't ask, well, did you give to charity previously? because maybe the mugger saw you giving to charity and thought you would also want to give them money. We don't treat it like that, right? We don't, um, someone brilliant on the internet, I don't know who they are, um, said, you know, rape is the only crime for which saying the temptation was too great to resist isn't a flat out confession to committing a crime, it's considered an excuse, right? And so those are all little bits of rape culture. This too is part of rape culture. When your government is making propaganda posters that say, hey, women who want to have sex with you are a threat to your health and national security. And so the flip side of that, the thing left unsaid is that the women who are safe to have sex with are the women who do not want to have sex with you. That's also a piece of rape culture. And I would go so far as to argue that the fact that out of all of the posters, the anti-VD propaganda posters, the government could choose to use as illustrative of this national health campaign. They choose to use these ones when there's so many others. That's a part of rape culture too, right? And so last but not least, because everything comes back to virginity for me, um, I argue that the reason we have this kind of national idea that women who want to have sex outside of marriage are dangerous and wrong is because it's so deeply ingrained in us that women should be virgins before marriage. And so then we can kind of connect those things too, right? And say that virginity just by its existence is also part of rape culture. Right, so if you have a culture that values virginity, particularly for women, with this idea women should be virgins before marriage, and if you don't want to be a virgin before marriage, or if you want to have a lot of sex outside of marriage, um, if there's something wrong with you and you're a threat to the nation, that is part of rape culture. That idea is inherently part of rape culture because the flip side of that idea is always we should be having sex with women who don't want to have sex. And again, there's only one word for that. So let me get rid of my PowerPoint for you. I'm not super familiar with Zoom. I don't totally know what I'm doing. Oh, it's the stop share button, of course. So that's my first mini lecture on World War II VD, anti-VD propaganda. It's absolutely fascinating. As you may have noticed from little things I said today, it's also a really interesting case study in public health. And since we are all living through kind of a public health crisis right now, uh, my next mini lecture is going to be on isms, like racism and sexism, and how they fuck up public health using kind of World War II VD as a lens and circling back around to COVID-19. So thanks for checking out this video. Uh, hit me up if you have any questions. I'm always happy to talk about this stuff and I'll see you soon.